So good evening, everyone. Uh, I recently had the uh, opportunity to investigate the SalesJS web framework. It comes with an object relational mapper, an ORM, <laughs> named Waterline. And uh, in my experiments with the software, I found some deficiencies and outright bugs, and I want to talk about them this evening. Here is a modification of the example code from the Getting Started documentation. So just a very quick flyby, we, we import some libraries. Then we tell the software, how is our data structured in the data store? Uh, most notably, the names and types of the attributes and the relationship between them. And then in the end, we connect to the database, create two data sets, and in the end, do a query. So this is how you write the, how you, how you work with a, a waterline ORM. Uh, first, I want to go into detail about the uh, data definition. These kind of attributes here need to always be written manually. Why do we need to write this manually? I don't know. There's no good reason because the database itself already knows about uh, you know, the tables and columns it has. And uh, what if I make a typo here or get the, the, get the type wrong? What if my database changes and my code is still the, on, on the old version? This is, uh, these are big problems. So other ORMs solve it in a way that, for example, code is dumped with a certain command, or even more convenient, you just connect to the database and the rest happens magically and you do not try to do this manually. Um, the example uh, getting started thing only had two uh, tables. Let's have a look at this example database. It has uh, 11 tables. This is called Chinook, which is a successor to the uh, Northwind database, if you have ever heard about that. So it comes, comes with a, a decent sized uh, sa sample uh, data and uh, schema, which you can try out in different kinds of software. Uh, this one, I want to concentrate about this piece here at the, at the top, just these three tables. Um, if you want to uh, use this in waterline, you have to write at least 50 more lines of code, writing all these definitions here, which already exist in the database manually. Uh, the magic approach would, some, would look uh, someone, something like this. Uh, get the library connect to the database, and at this point you already have all the objects from the database, uh, all, all the things from the database available as objects. Uh, these correspond to the schema. And uh, this is possible because uh, all the databases know about themselves already. And you can ask them, hey, what, what kind of tables do you have? What kind of uh, column names are there? And what are the types? Uh, LS, no support for this in Waterline. Um, what I've shown here, this is called reverse engineering from a database into a schema. This exists in lots kind of software, for example, the graphical modeling tool uh, where it was taking the screenshot from. Uh, but we are, wa we are forced to waste a huge amount of time and need to write this manually. Next problem. Um, this is about the primary keys. Uh, it's very popular to uh, use auto increment integers. Um, but uh, what many people do not know that uh, this also leaks information to someone who you perhaps do not want to know how many stuff, how, how many rows of a certain thing you have. So the solution for this is using random identifiers. The UUID type is popular and it does not uh, leak the information because each identifier is completely independent from the other one. There's no increment per se. Uh, now what happens if we use the UID type in waterline? For example, like something like this. Uh, here we define the ID, which is a primary uh, key, and we give it the type. Um, waterline actually does not know about the type. This will be silently replaced by the text type. And then when you create a query, like model.find something, 
uh, it will generate SQL code like this. But LOA only works on text type, not on UUID type, which is something different. And this is an X, S, uh, the SQL type error. The database will, database will uh, throw an error at, in this place. And you can't continue. Uh, Waterline gives you um, automatically created uh, timestamp fields. They, they are called created at and updated at. And this is useful for the HTTP caching part in Sales.js. Uh, but if you let the ORM create these timestamps, you will only get full seconds, like 12 o'clock, three minutes, two seconds, and then zero, zero, zero at the end. Even if your database supports lower resolution, like microseconds, you will only get full seconds. Next problem. This is a very common thing to have in your average uh, uh, CRUD web application. The absurd, which is known by many names in different SQL dialects and different databases. So the point is uh, you want to insert a row, but if the key, you know, the ID, corresponding to the row already exists. You do not create a new row, but instead you update the fields. This is absurd or merge. And this is a, an atomic operation, so it happens either completely or not at all. In Waterline, there's no support for this concept. There is no, uh, nothing that generates uh, the SQL corresponding to the concept. So you need to do a query. Hey, does this row already exist? Does, do we have the key in the, in the database? And then conditionally either insert a new, line, a new row or uh, update the existing line. And between the query and the following uh, write operation, there's the possibility to, uh, to create a race condition. So it might happen that you lose data because there will be a query, a different write, and then a new write, which is sad when you lose data. Uh, pagination, this is the concept where you uh, uh, partition your data stream into like, into like windows or pages because the web page can only hold so much items at once and then the user advances to the next page. This is called pagination. Uh, the find method from the ORM has support for this with a skip uh, attribute here and it will create a corresponding offset uh, statement in SQL, but this is really problematic. Let's have a look at this nice web page. So the problem is um, the database must still fetch all the rows which came before and order them because this is mandated by the SQL standard. So the, the further you go with the offset, the more uh, slow it becomes by design. So the solution to the problem is, oh, there's, there are also other problems associated with the problem, but I can't go into the detail now. The, the real solution is to uh, remember where you have been the last time and continue from there. This is efficient because this can use an index in the database. But, uh, the, but there's no support for this kind of uh, pagination using key sets in the ORM. You only get skip creating an offset, and this is inefficient, sadly. If we want to uh, solve the famous n plus one problem, so you, where you have uh, stuff related to the data set you're trying to query, then you join the related uh, uh, tables on the table you're having. For example, uh, there are several tracks on one album and each track also has a genre. And we want to extract some inf information from, from this related data set and then sort by the genre name and the title. So the corresponding uh, JavaScript code might look something like this. Uh, find, pre-populate, this is so fine. And then we want to sort it by genre name. But the sort function creates this a fragment like this, track, which is the first data uh, uh, table set, and then the literal genre.name, which of course does not exist. So you can only sort by uh, columns which exist on the main table, but not on the related tables. 
Next problem. Let's have a look at the dump. Uh, the, what's so funny about this? This is. This, it's funny that you're not crying. I, I've seen worse. I'm, <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I, I'm jaded. Okay. Um, you know, the, the example program had the console log uh, result of the model.find command at the, at the end of the example program, and the result would something, look something like this. So here's a result set with its columns and uh, automatically created uh, date timestamps, and here's a relation. So what's, what's the problem with this? Um, it's only dumb data. You can just read it verbatim. What's the problem with that? It makes uh, late binding and overriding of the uh, names impossible. In better ORMs, you instead get an object back instead of a data structure. And it comes with accessors for each column. And this makes it possible for you to automatically inflate or deflate val uh, values. For example, this timestamp from the database can be automatically converted into a JavaScript native date object, which is convenient. So you do not need to deserialize this manually uh, because it happens when you call the accessor, which is a method and can be overwritten from, from the ORM or even from your user code, which you cannot do with dumb data. Uh, also, these kind of triggers, uh, the uh, inflation triggers can also only happen when you actually uh, read stuff from the object. So this is late binding. So it, the whole thing is still efficient, even if there is a lot of inflation going on. Sadly, uh, you only, uh, sadly, the only thing you get back is the data structure. And the last one, no mention of transaction on isolation levels in the documentation. So as you might know, uh, JavaScript programming is uh, uh, medium to highly concurrent because of its uh, programming style and either continuation passing or using promises. There's not a single uh, synchronous or blocking uh, function call in the ORM, it's all uh, promises-based. But you do not want to be subject to races, data races, you know, where you accidentally overwrite stuff because that would lead to data loss. So if you look at the documentation of your average uh, database, it will go at great lengths uh, about situation, what, what happens when there are things going on at the same time, how do you solve the problems, what kind of uh, SQL programming do you need to use. It teaches you the concepts of, of isolation and what, what is a transaction, what does it mean to roll back and stuff like that. All of this has no, uh, has no equivalent in the ORM. So there is some SQL generation, but nothing dealing with these kind of problems. So I can already say, if you do some uh, heavily concurrent programming, there will be data races, there will be data loss. Sad face. <laughs> <sighs> so, then the usual questions from the peanut gallery. Did you send a patch? <laughs> no, no, I did not. Uh, this is a lot of code uh, to, to solve uh, uh, even one of these eight problems. I did not do it yet. But did you file a bug? Yeah, I would like to, uh, but I wanted to first, uh, I have collected all the information as you can see, uh, but I want to first um, get feedback from the community. <clears throat> so if you have any comments on this, I'm finished with my material and I would like to invite questions or comments from you. Thank you. Just a short question because I didn't get that. Uh, this is kind of a, a ORM intended to be used on Node.js and with MS SQL or PostgreSQL or which which SQL backend? This is part of this framework, Salesjs. Yeah. And there are backends for many different data stores. Twelve at least, I think. Okay. Both SQL and no SQL. Okay, but Salesjs basically is is situated at, at the server side. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, just for sure. Uh, why did you did this research? I mean, do you have to use these frameworks? No, I don't have to use this framework. Let's skip to another one. <laughs>
Have you done a real project with uh, Sales.js? Because it looks like it's it's still on Express 3 and it looks like it's not developed anymore. Or, yeah, it's long time. I think it's 0.11 or something. No, I did not uh, do a real project with it yet. All this in investigation and finding these eight problems was uh, experimenting with the software on the first day. So basically just modifying the getting started things. So I, I assume there are even more problems, which I will find if I uh, continue to investigate it, sadly. Um, did you, uh, have you ever evaluated any other uh, RM frameworks or compared it, compare it to any other? Yes, I compared it to the capabilities of other ORMs I am familiar with, which are uh, SQL Alchemy and DBIX class. But in Node.js? Node.js. Uh, I, I looked at SQLize, but that was like one and a half years ago. And at that point in time, they also did not have the automatic uh, code generation. You also need to write your schema manually, which is absurd. I don't like it. Usually. Like all these things are, all these things are meant to be used in a way that you write your schema in your favorite programming language and have the ORM actually generate the tables on the fly. That's one. That's one way to use it. But there are two problems with this approach. Namely, uh, the database uh, already knows about its stuff. Okay, this is a given. The other thing, uh, there are many more modeling tools for on on the SQL side at the database side than modeling tools for the framework. Actually, the only thing you can do is write text in a text editor, and there's no graphical stuff like that. And uh, also, the types aren't even insufficient, and uh, there is no equivalent for the check constraints and stuff. The ORM is always lacking uh, or lagging behind the capabilities of the database itself. So the, 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 the point of where the information is residing should be in the database and not in the ORM code. Um, so he was talking about the, the code first approach, and you're talking about the database first approach. Um, if we, if I would like to use it, and I'm definitely not wanting to use it, but if I would like to use it uh, from a code first approach, um, do you know of any uh, migration stuff that this can do for me? Like if I change the schema, which is tedious, as you said, can it create me an actual SQL migration? Uh, or is it really dumb? Uh, this software? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Perhaps it comes with a migration tool, but I would tend to uh, use an external migration tool instead because uh, those are more specialized and more featureful than, than uh, tightly integrated stuff. Perhaps you have heard of Squitch, which is written like S Q I T C H. Switch like like switch, but with SQL. <laughs> so this enables uh, tracking of changes uh, independent of databases and independent of frameworks, which is nice. I uh, just <clears throat> wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, I understand the problems. I used sales a couple of times. Um, I know of these things. Um, just some things I'm not sure if they're really bugs. For example, the date thing, because actually sales is more an API as a service, you know, they don't think that you do much server side. They actually think you have your front end, which might be Angular or React, and you just request the data, you know. So that's why they think they use this way. But yeah, um, the problem I think is, I think they have um, tremendous ideas um, with this project. I mean, there's stuff like data, any database, you can like connect any database, different databases, and actually we once we had a relation between two different databases, like a relation between MySQL and MongoDB, and you can actually like join them. So there's actually really cool stuff happening, but they just got so slow with the development and the bug fixing, and that's, I think that's why the issue why it still looks like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to reply about the part uh, uh, with, with the date stuff. I, the inflation of date uh, was only an example. There are um, uh, other... Uh, 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 there are other reasons why you would have would like to have accessors instead of just a dump data structure. Perhaps you're familiar with aspect-oriented programming, where you can override uh, functions or methods uh, with keywords like around, before, after, uh, instead of just um, 
overwriting the method in inheritance. So this requires that there is code, so a function, a method. With, da with just data structures, you cannot override it. If there's a method, you can do aspect-oriented programming to change the code, how it is happening. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for watching this talk. Down below, you can find our channel, VNLGS, where you can find a lot of different videos about front end and back end JavaScript. And feel free to subscribe.